So I put a video out on Instagram asking for a topic and the topic that first came in was performance enhancing drugs or PEDS. So today's video is all gonna be looking at those substances that people take to try and improve their performance. So let's get cracking looking at performance enhancing drugs. So if you are new to the channel, I'm Rich from Planet PE. Um, I do a video every week looking at different topics and I'm on Instagram and Facebook and also Twitter. So if you wanna get involved, it is planet underscore PE on those different platforms. So let's get moving, have a look at the different types of drugs that people take, the reasons why people take drugs and the benefits that they may achieve in certain activities. So there are a category of drugs which if you were to take them in sport would be termed as performance enhancing. And what that means is basically it's gonna help you be better at your sport. Now that's gonna come in lots of different ways and there's gonna be different drugs that help different sports to be better. Now all of them are illegal because they are in performance enhancing, they are making you artificially better or giving you an unfair advantage over your competitors. So there's lots of different types of drugs that we're gonna look at. We're also gonna have a look at the, a different type of drug which is subject to different conditions but isn't necessarily a performance enhancing drug unless it's in one different sport. And we're gonna look at the advantages and the disadvantages of taking them. So let's first of all put up the different categories that we have. So we have stimulants, we have narcotic analgesics, we have anabolic agents, we have peptide hormones, blood doping and beta blockers. So they are our different ones that you need to know. Now let's start off by having a look at the one that most of you will know the most about because it's one that lots and lots of you take every single day without realizing. I know. So we're gonna start off looking at stimulants. So what the stimulants are, they are a drug that if you were to take it would improve your alertness. They will raise your um, heart rate, they will improve your reaction time. So an example of this would be caffeine. But obviously, you're not seeing too many athletes going to take loads and loads of tea before they race or having a big cup of coffee. They will potentially take it in a different form. Now, let's say that I'm a sprinter. If I can make my reaction time way, way better, way shorter, it means that I'm going to be able to react to that gun loads quicker. It's going to make me have a better start in my race, therefore have a better chance of winning the race. If I'm a goalkeeper, if I can get my reactions better, if I can be more alert, more chance of me saving the shots. Now, there's gonna be some disadvantages there because I'm gonna have the potential that my body might overheat and things like that, but we're not worrying about that too much at the moment. The next one is narcotic analgesics. Now, these are just quite simply painkillers. So if I was gonna take a different type of painkiller um, away from um, my normal kind of things, it would give me an advantage because it would allow me to train with possibly injuries, it allowed me to participate when I might be in pain. It will allow me to train or overtrain without maybe having the effects that I would normally get without them. So narcotic analgesics are simply painkillers. The next one we've got are anabolic agents. Now you would probably term these as steroids. So steroids come in lots of different forms, but at GCCPE, particularly in the AQA course, you need to understand they are anabolic agents. Now I'm going to show you something in a sec which is all of the different 100 meter times and all of the different ones that have been taken out as far as the greatest ones ever because people have have failed tests. So have a look at this little diagram here. Lots and lots and lots of red lines on this one. Every red line on there is somebody who has been removed and their time doesn't count because they have failed a drug test. Why are sprinters failing drug tests? Well, sprinting is, is an activity that is gonna be you trying to be as powerful as possible and move your entire body as quickly as possible. Anabolic agents like steroids would be perfect for you to do that. Now, if you notice, there's only one person on that list that hasn't failed that test, that hasn't done it. And that happens to be the fastest man in the world ever, Usain Bolt, which kind of makes his feet seem even more amazing, the fact that all of these athletes have failed drug tests. They've been, they've been uh, very suspicious in their activities, but yet Usain Bolt never fails a test, 
which mm-hmm. is 9.58 seconds, fastest man the world has ever seen. We might look at that in a sec to see, well, is he, are his um, accomplishments being taken away because of everybody else? So if people take anabolic agents, they are trying to improve their muscle mass. They're therefore gonna be stronger and more powerful. So any activity that requires power and muscular strength could be a sport where somebody might take anabolic agents to improve their power, their strength, their muscle mass. So rugby, you know, harder, more powerful tackles, running faster in any sport, in athletics, things like throwing things further. If I was a fast bowler in cricket, I might be able to bowl faster. So all of those different things might be a reason why people may take anabolic agents. We've then got diuretics. Now diuretics can, can come in lots of different forms, but where people would take a diuretic is that they are trying to lose weight very, very quickly normally. So what diuretics do is that they get rid of all of your excess fluid. They basically increase your urine production. Now, if that's happening, I'm gonna be losing mass. I'm gonna be losing weight because we are pretty much water. So let's say that I was a UFC fighter. Let's say I was a boxer. If I was a jockey, if I was a judo player, all of those sports have weight categories. So what I'm gonna try and do is get down to a weight that maybe is a bit lighter than what I'm currently standing at. Well, that would give me an advantage over my opposition because maybe my walking weight is gonna be higher and then when I then rehydrate, I'm adding that fluid back in and I'm actually heavier than the person I'm fighting against. Now, the downside to that is that you can be dehydrated. We can have, again, overheating the body. So lots of things in there that you don't necessarily want. The other reason someone might take a diuretic is that they can actually use it as a masking agent. So if I took, if I took anabolic agents like steroids, if I want to flush them out of my system, maybe by taking a diuretic, it might flush everything out, so therefore there's no trace of it, so therefore maybe I wouldn't get banned. So you know, people do use diuretics in slightly different ways rather than just losing weight. The next one we've got are peptide hormones. Okay, so there's different peptide hormones, and what they do is that they increase the oxygen carrying capacity in the blood, because what they actually do is that they create more red blood cells. So the one that people tend to use in, uh, in sport, and cycling is the biggest one for this, is that they use something called EPO. So the real term for it is erythropoietin, but you only need to know it's EPO, and actually in GCCPE, just talk about it as a peptide hormone. So that peptide hormone is gonna stimulate your body to go and create more red blood cells. Now the advantage of that is that you're gonna have more red blood cells, so therefore you're gonna be able to carry more oxygen in your blood, so therefore train harder for longer without fatigue. Again, that lovely term that you hear lots and lots of in different exams. So if I was an endurance cyclist, it means that I would be able to work harder for longer and not be tired, so therefore I'm getting more uh, oxygen around the body. It means that I'm gonna be able to work aerobically for longer, so that kind of thing that slows people down, like the creation of lactic acid, the fact that we can't get rid of the uh, carbon dioxide like we want to, I'm not going to be creating that in the same ways because I'm going to be working aerobically for much, much longer. So peptide hormones like EPO, generally used for endurance athletes like marathon runners and cyclists. On that as well, we have something called blood doping. So blood doping is an interesting kind of thing that people used to do and probably still do, to be honest. And it has the same impact as these um, peptide hormones. So what will happen? So let's imagine that I'm going to be doing a competition in six to eight weeks time. I'm going to take out a litre of my blood. I'm going to go and freeze that because I'm going to need it later on. I will then continue to train. I'll do whatever I normally do in my normal life. And my body will eventually create new blood cells and give and basically top up the blood. So I'm back to my six pints of blood or whatever I normally have. So I've taken that blood out. I'm then going to eventually put it back in. So I've now got more blood. So the fact that I've got more blood, again, means I've got more red blood cells. Brilliant. The disadvantage of having more more red blood cells is the fact that we can actually get things like blood clots. There's an increased chance of um, heart attack. There's an increased chance of stroke because I've got this big thick blood now that has loads and loads and loads of red blood cells in. So that blood doping one, literally take blood out, go and train at a time uh, closer to your competition, put the blood back in, you've got more red blood cells. So the whole point of that is that I can increase my oxygen carrying capacity. The next one and the final one are beta blockers. So beta blockers uh, don't necessarily fit in the performance enhancing category, but they are performance enhancing in some sports. 
So they're called drugs which are subject to certain restrictions. So with beta blockers, what they do is that they are used to try and release um, tension, they are used to try and reduce your heart rate, to try and lower your blood pressure, they reduce the effects of adrenaline. So basically all those things about being over aroused, they could lower that. They also improve your fine motor control and how precise you are. So let's start as a darts player. I wanna try and get that dart in that very, very tiny little part of the board that's gonna have the most amount. Now every little twitch that I has, have um, is gonna have an impact. In archery, that is the biggest one. So in archery, they actually fire between heartbeats. So if I was to hold my thumb out here, every time my heart beats, my thumb flickers. So archery actually fire between heartbeats. So if I can get my heart rate really, really low, it means that when I'm firing, it can go boom, 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 and I fire. So by taking beta blockers, that lowering of the heart rate, that improve the improvement of the fine motor controls could be a massive advantage. Now, the side effects of that is that I could be quite sick, I could feel quite nauseous, I could have weakness within the muscles, I could have some heart problems. That is why beta blockers are only prescribed by medical professionals. So I used to take a beta blocker to try and slow down my, um, my thyroid gland. Um, it had those effects, as you said there, that actually sometimes you feel a bit weak, but it did what it was supposed to do. If you are an athlete, if you're taking these things, it could have quite significant impacts to your life. So all of the different forms of and drugs have negative side effects. Lots of them around fertility, some of them around uh, increased chance of heart attack or strokes, things like that. That's something we'll look at at a later time. So what you have to understand, so this is from the specification. So students should be taught to understand in which sports performers may use PED, so performance enhancing drugs with examples. Hopefully I've been able to give you that. Now what you want to understand with about doping or PEDS in general is why somebody would take it, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages, and also what is the disadvantage to the sport of people taking drugs. So that's probably more likely the, what you would get in some of the extended type questions. So if I was going to go and take an, a performance enhancing drug, it is going to increase my chances of winning. It's going to increase my chance of being successful. Well, that has some pretty significant impact. That means that I'm going to have more chance of making money, being famous. I'm going to have more chance of wealth. I'm actually going to potentially level the playing field. So let's go back to that idea of Usain Bolt. So Usain Bolt was the fastest man in the world and still is. Everybody who was getting close to him, according to this graph, has failed a test. Now they may have felt that the only way they could get close to him was to take performance and drugs. They may have felt wrongly, by the way, legal people wrongly, that Usain Bolt had taken performance enhancing drugs. So they may have felt, well, I need to take them because I think he is. Now Usain Bolt has never failed a test, so therefore that would be completely unfounded. However, they may have felt that, so their advantage was that they were thinking they were leaving the playing field. Well, everyone else is, so why don't I? That kind of um, thought. The disadvantages of about taking performance enhancing drugs is actually it's cheating. You will get banned if you are caught. So typically it's a two year ban. There's some pretty significant health risks with taking those drugs because they're not designed for everybody to take. So there's gonna be some side effects like most medications out there out there. You're gonna get fined, you're gonna get banned, your reputation will be you as a drug cheat. Now I'm not sure that you'd necessarily want that, as an athlete and you're you know, a full-time job, trying to make money and trying to get sponsors and all those sort of thing. So trying to do it legally would be far, far better. But if you didn't get caught, how would we ever know? And that's kind of the point. Now on the sport, that causes a bit of a problem because let's say we are in a, in a situation like cycling where Lance Armstrong won seven Tour de France titles. He failed a test once, but yet, apparently was taking drugs for every single Tour de France that he won. Now that means that we now can't trust that sport anymore because their best person, their most marketable candidate has failed a, a test and actually has then found that every time he's won, 
has been doping. It means that our sport's no longer credible. So when we look at Usain Bolt, his reputation is tarnished because of all those people that failed drugs tests. Now that has a big impact on the sport, do we trust it, do we then trust his times? And that becomes quite a problem about how credible that activity is. So that is everything you need to know about performance enhancing drugs. So there's um, lots of different types. Every sport has a drug that would probably help them, but yet all those disadvantages outweigh the advantages of taking performance enhancing drugs. So I know there's lots of mocks coming up. This is a paper two topic. It will probably be in there because it always, always is. So keep watching, keep subscribing, and make sure guys you click the bell. If you've made it to the end of the video, give us a little thumbs up or give us a comment to tell me you've got there. Maybe comment drugs. See, we have a little club. Only people get this far are the special ones. Cheers, bye.